Where is what? It's, yes, it's under the Adobe Master Collection. So cascading style sheets are what we use to give a visual look to a page. In the pages that you created for the ugly web page, you should have noticed that they were, in fact, pretty ugly. You know, white letters, basic, nothing, just captions. So why do we want to do that, have these ugly HTML pages? So we can make them pretty, yes, eventually. However, you have to realize that the web now is the main for, uh, source of information, even for people who are visually impaired, who have all kinds of different things going on. So a lot of people have screen readers and things like that that are reading pages to them. To them. So it's not good for screen readers to have a bunch of superfluous information in there. It makes it hard. So I think that was probably one of the biggest drivers to get all of the style information out of HTML um, and everything, all the visual types of stuff. So we wanted that all gone. So anything, you know, how many of you have done web pages like five years ago? Okay, you all are going to have more trouble with this than everybody else because you're going to have the temptation to put in, you know, tags to make font bold and, and, you know, wanting to change font sizes and things inside of your HTML code, for which I will knock down your grade. Because all of that type of stuff really should be dealt with in the cascading style sheets. Okay, so let's take a look at how this stuff goes together. I have just, I created a basic site, and I want to make sure that I'm using that basic site, which I am. It's already defined here. And I'm just going to create a basic HTML tag, HTML page. So this is nice. We're using Dreamweaver, and I do have it in the split view. And from now on, you can use Dreamweaver because Dreamweaver has code hints in it, which you will find to be very handy and much better than trying to memorize every different style tag that you can put with every tag. Because of the code hints, it will tell you. You don't always have to look stuff up. So, I have my code window and I have my, my layout view, my design window, and I'm looking at it here split on purpose. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put some content, just general content in my page. Now, typically, and we're going to talk about the box model, but typically what you're going to have is a web page that has a container around it. Oh, here we go. That has a container around it and then has maybe a heading, maybe a left navigation, a main content, and a footer, right? Now, even if you have like curvy lines and nice curvy graphics in the background, typically if you really look at any web page, no matter how round and curvy it looks because of the way the graphics lead the eye, it's always in, in rectangles. So this is called the box model, right? Um, and you have to think about this because this one div out here that contains everything, that is the container div. It's almost always called the container. And that, if you think of that, that's like your big box from Amazon, right? And then you have your little boxes inside. And your little boxes ha may have margins these are margins here, between the sides of the big box and the sides of the inside boxes, that's a margin. So you usually just have top margin, left margin, and right margin. If you're really desperate, you can have bottom margin, but that doesn't happen all the time because, you know, you never know what people are going to be scrolling up and down. But if because of your graphical interface, you may have a bottom margin. And then inside of these boxes, you may have text or whatever. And the space between the content of the box and the side of this box, if this was a figurine, a glass figurine, instead of text, what would we call the stuff in a box that holds it in place? Bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. We would call it bubble wrap, also known as padding. So the stuff that holds your text in place inside of the div is called padding. 
the stuff around the div between, between one box and another is a margin. So you got a margin. Or actually, that may, may even sh show up as padding for the other box. Probably not. I think it's going to be a margin between the okay, two. So the padding is inside, like if you want to do point five or Right. Five. And then you have to make sure that all of these things add up, like this plus the padding plus the content plus this plus the margin plus the padding plus the content plus the padding plus the margin. All of that is 100% of the width or the number of pixels. So when you add up stuff to figure out a width, you have to add all of that together. It has to add up to the number of pixels. Like if this is, you know, you wanted to do 1280 pixels across, all of these things, this plus padding plus content plus padding plus margin plus padding plus content plus padding plus margin, all of that has to add up to the 1280, okay? That is the way the box model works. So no matter how nice and swirly and round it looks, stuff may be swirly and round looking because they're faking you out with a nice swirly round looking background graphic or something like that, but it's not really. Everything is always in boxes. Okay, so how do we keep track of that? Um, and too bad I didn't actually get to see that. I'll have to maybe go in when I record this and put in graphics or something. But how this works is I am going to have my div. Well, here, I'll start typing this out. I have my div division. And this one is going to have an ID. What's the ID going to be, do you think? Container. An ID differentiates itself from a class. You can have a class or you can have an ID. With IDs, there is only one. For this web page, there is only going to be one container. There will probably only be one banner. There will be one left nav. There will be one main content. But if you have things that there may be more than one of, then you can use a class. I'll show you how to do that. But right now, all you do is you put ID container. And I have to go down here, and this looks, this is cool, watch. If I just hit this, uh, the carrot here, and I just put a slash, Dreamweaver knows that I need to close that div. And as soon as I put the slash, it does it automatically for me. Because it knows I'm missing that. It is very nifty. So, you know, I use Dreamweaver it really as a code, to help me with the code. I don't really like it so much for the visual layout. I, it's, it's not bad, I guess, but... Okay, so I have my div container, so I need here my div header or, or banner or something, I want to call it, because I don't want to confuse it with this heading, because a lot of times I call this the header. So I'm going to put in here my div, and I'm going to give this one an ID also, because there's only going to be one content or one head banner, whatever. So I'm going to call it banner head. And notice that I have to put these things in quotations because otherwise it's going to think they're a variable. Okay, and I'm going to say in here, hello world. That's my contents. And I'm going to close that div. So now I have down here, next row down, I have my left navigation. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to actually, I'll just give this one a class because maybe I have navigation here and navigation down here. So I'm going to want to call them both nav, who knows. So I'm going to say div. Now I'm going to say class equals nav. And I can put in here a list or whatever I want. I don't know. And I would put links or whatever in here, but I don't want to because it's not 
The only thing about that, um, you see how it did that? It closed it for me. A lot of times, like, I, I close it, and it closes it, and then I just keep typing because I'm not. So I'll have, like, the tag twice, so it gets kind of messed up. Okay, let's call this uh, Alamo. See, I got a mess there. See, it's watch. I, I just hit this, and it's closing all my tags right in order for me. I'm just hitting the left carrot and the line, and it's closing them in order as I go. Very handy dandy that. Okay, and then I have my last one: div contents. Good enough. Okay. So, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to refresh. And I want to see it. So there's my, my page. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this as into my folder. I'm just going to call it index. Okay. So that is an ugly web page, is it not? Pretty much. Pretty much ugly. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make this Hello World a header because I realized I forgot that. Huh? Oops, I need to. Very good. Good catch. I need to move all of that down to the body. No, I didn't do it on purpose. Yes, I did it on purpose to see if you'd catch it. I have it below the head, but not in the body, so I need to move that down. The thing was is that it was between the head and the body, but that was a good catch, very good. Though it's not going to affect how it, how it works, but good one. Okay, so there we go. I have everything all kind of laid out there. So now what we're going to do is I can start putting in style information. And style information can go in three places. If you look at the, H, the uh, CSS2 rubric, which hopefully I will go ahead and combine, but you'll see that it has um, embedded cascading style sheet, embedded CSS, inline CSS, and external CSS. So the first place I want to show you is inline. And this is the least desirable of places to do it. But if in a pinch, Let's say I wanted to put a style inside of that container. I'm going to go ahead and type in here inside of that div tag. And then it pops up these code hints for me. So I want to do a background color. I could even put a background image, but I don't want to. Let's see, background color. Use. Okay. Lovely. So notice that I have this whole thing, style equals, and then the whole thing is in quotations. And as soon as you pop open the quotation, it pops up code hints. Actually, I need to put one thing I've forgotten here is I need to end my line always with a semicolon. Now, after the semicolon, I could go in here and put something else. And it will see what I want to do. Let's do a border. Border uh, dashed. There we go. Uh, the semicolon goes before the quotation, but after after the line. So notice. So I could have actually multiple things in here. Like I have border dashed. If I want to do other things about the border, I could say color green, 
But everything that deals with the borders after the semicolon or after the colon and then before the semicolon. That's how I break everything down. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to refresh that. And there we go. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, that is the least desirable place to do it, is in line. Because that means that for every single tag that you have, that you want to put style, you're going to have to have to do that. That's kind of a stinky thing, especially, you know, when you start getting into like all of your headers or all of your font, you want to be the same thing. You don't want to have to style it each time you have a, for let's say, let's say list items, for instance. I'm going to go ahead and put this up here in the head. This is an embedded style. So in the tag is called inline. This is called embedded. Now, I don't want to have to put style in each list item, right? That would be stinky. So I can actually go ahead and make a style tag here up in the top. And now I have a block where I can do whatever I want. I'm going to say list item. And then I'm going to put in semi, uh, not semicolons, curly braces. So I have the tag itself, and that's one of the three ways I can identify things. I can identify things by tag, I can identify things by class, and I can identify things by ID, right? Then we can get into pseudo classes and things, which we will do here shortly, but let's uh, take a look at this here. So now I can say, what do I want to do? Uh, let's change the text, the font size, I don't know, of my text items. List item. What did I do? Obviously, I have an error in here somewhere. I'm not quite sure what I did wrong. You don't have to open or close that list anywhere? Not right here. Because it's under style? Mm-mm. That just tells me what it is. I can figure out what that is. I don't want to figure it out right at the moment. So let's do H1 tag. Okay. So I have H, whoops, H1. I can call by tag. Then open and close it and say, uh, let's do font color because that's the most, or we can do font family. Let's do Georgia. Well, no, it's maybe that's what it already is. Let's do Palatino. Now, font families are cool because what it does is it will look, like if you're trying to use a funky font that maybe all Macintoshes have but Windows machines don't have or something, you can go ahead and list that font here and then maybe the Windows equivalent, and maybe one different, because what it's going to do is it's going to go down the list. Does it have Palatino Linotype? No. Does it have Book Antigua? No. Oh, but it has regular Palatino, and so it'll do that. So a font family, you can put a list of various fonts, and it will check for various fonts. And then you have to put the default. Like here, it's going to default to a serif font. So I'm going to go ahead, and I'm going to close this with another curly brace. So everything I want about this H1 has to be contained within these curly braces. Can you see the font changing there? I can't. It's putting more space. Huh? Um, because that's just what it is. It is what it is. And for some reason, this is just not showing up for me. I'm not really seeing it change. I'm seeing it bump my thing. You see it change? Let's change the font family and see if we can get something more dramatic here. So all I have to do is go back, put in my semicolon, it's going to pop up a thing for me. And with my semicolon, there we go. That one's a little bit more noticeable, isn't it? So you can see it going on. Now I can put in a whole string of things in here if I want. Uh, let's say background color. 
you're not going to want to do a lot of these things because they're just it's ugly. I'm not trying to make it pretty, but I want you to make yours pretty. So I can do all kinds of stuff. I can also do placement, but I wouldn't do that with this particular one. Let's see. Um, with my contents here, I have my div class nav and my div contents. So what we can start doing is trying to size and place these things. Um, but I'm going to say my div class nav. And when I identify something as a class, see how this is class equals nav, right? To identify a class, I put a dot. And I'm going to say nav. And that indicates to the cascading style sheet that it is, an, it is a class and not a tag or not an ID. Now it knows what to look for. So now I can go in here and I can say, uh, width, and I want my width of this to be 70%. And I want it to float to the right. Okay, so if I have that, what do you think I want my, my uh, nav to be? Oh, wait, no. I want that to be 30% and I want it to float to the left. Sorry. Oh, man, I gave it away. Right, so we want the contents, or what did I call it? I want uh, class contents. Sometimes I have to copy and paste these things because otherwise I spell stuff. I'm a terrible speller. So now I can say dot contents. Width equals 70%. Colon float right. And that, my friends, is how we place things. Make sense? Now, I'm using percentages here because this way, if I take a look at it inside of my browser, Now, we're going to talk about how to make website, web pages responsive more so later. Like, I could actually, instead of doing that, I could have pixel sizes. Like, I could define, um, oh, let's talk about contents for the, if I am defining an ID or doing a, sizes for an ID, or excuse me, doing cascading information, style sheet information for an ID, instead of using a dot, I'm going to use a pound sign. And that is how you tell the CSS that you're dealing with an ID rather than a, a class. So I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to look my, it's called ID equals container. I think I can spell that. Tell me if I spell it wrong. Now I could say here width equals 1280 or something well you know what we're going to get into responsive things it, that means it would be set at 1280 now later on we can get into media queries where it's going to be okay I want it this big for a monitor and when the monitor shrinks down to a tablet it needs to be laid out like this and those that's done with media queries okay. Yeah, for the purpose of this assignment, we're going to pretend that we are developing only for, for full screen. So I'm going to go ahead and file save this. And then you can see it. And see now it's, did I refresh? It's no longer responsive. 
See the difference there? Okay, so that's how we do placement and how we align things. Um, oh, just for giggles, I want to talk to you about margins and padding here. Um, let's see. Uh, let's give a background color to these things. Uh, so that you can tell which one where stuff ends and where it begins. Let's make that gray. And let's make contents. Well, I guess I don't need to, do I? As long as one's gray and one's white, you'll see the difference. Okay. Now see right now there is no margins or padding in between those, right? This, the content is bumped right up to the edge. Got it? Okay, actually I am for that. For the contents, I'm going to go ahead and give it a background color. Or just for fun, to transition you into the way we're going to do it when you start making images and things, I can give it a background image. And I have an image actually in here already. Now you would never do this because this would totally mess with visibility. But uh, there we go. I can even give it a height if I want. Uh, let's say 250 pixels. And you know what? I want to make the con the text in there white so we can see it and bigger. So I can say uh, color usually is just for font itself. So let's make it white. Well, let's make it a little bit bigger. Font size 18. Semicolon. Let's make it bigger. Okay. Okay. So you can see right now, these are bumped right up between right next to each other right and the words here are right in there so there is n right now no margins and no padding right so I'm gonna go ahead and let's add some maybe left margin to this to contents so I'm gonna go ahead in here I'm gonna say margin left let's give it uh, 20 pixels. Now this is going to mess stuff up. Why would this mess things up? Where's my issue going to be in here? Oh, well, yeah. But how many pixels or what? What is our total percentage now? This is 30. This is 70. And this is it's 20, right? So let's see what happens. See if it messes it up or not. I'm going to go ahead and save that. And it bumped it down because I'm over 100%. And that's a problem I see a lot. That's why I went ahead and kept this error even though I knew it was there because students do this one all the time. Why is this not lining up? Well, because your pixels somewhere along the line are not adding up. You need to make sure that you're adding in your margins and your padding and things like that. So. Do your math right, exactly. There's a little bit of math required here, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make this 60%, and I'm going to make this one 20%, and, okay, so does that add up right now? 20, 60, 60, or 20, 20, 20. File, save. There we go. And see, now I have a margin between the two boxes. So it just basically pushed it over 
It pushed it over, right? It put a margin. Remember, margins are between between boxes, between divs. Yes. Yeah, you can be un yeah, you can be under 100% and it will usually float left unless you tell it otherwise. And here it would probably not it would if I had under 20 I in fact, I could take out that margin and it wouldn't make a difference. Why? Cuz I'm floated left and right exactly. So I don't even really need that margin if I did that it should not change because this is 20% and this is 60%, but this floats right and that floats left. So I have 20% dead, but it's in the middle, right? Okay, so let's take a look at padding. What does padding do? Right, so I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to say padding. Padding, I want right, left, left padding. Let's say left padding, and I'm going to give it 40 pixels instead of. Now that bumped this over. Why? Because it's less percent. Because already, remember, I'm only 20% here, I'm 60% here. The place where it has to, re to take out chunks is in the middle. So that 40% came out of the, or the 40 pixels came out of the dead space in the middle. But see how padding here is within the box, but it's keeping things from touching the side of the box. Didn't the padding move, so the padding moved it more to the right, correct? Right, because remember, since I took out the margins in here, the inside is dead, but okay, let's watch what happens if I put that margin back in there of 20%. Margin left. Anybody guess what's going to happen? Any guesses? Let's see. Why did it go down? Because I'm over 100. Right now, to be exact, I'm 40 pixels over 100. Because I added in, I have 20%, 60%, 20%, plus 40 pixels. So I'm 100% plus 40 pixels, which bumped that down to the next line. Okay, an image that is circular is only pretending to be circular. All images are rectangular no matter what, but they may have transparent edges around them that make them appear to be transparent, to be, but everything's really square no matter what. Okay, so do you kind of have the whole cascading style sheet thing going on? Oh, you know what I want to do? Instead of doing that, I want to go ahead and take this out. Somebody was asking a question. I can. You know what? When we start getting into responsive websites, actually, you probably will start uh, mixing. And we're going to get into bootstrap templates, and they do actually mix. But it's easier logically. Like when you're doing something like that to keep it either all in percentage or all in pixels because, you know, I don't know what percentage 40 pixels is going to be. Right, unless you really want to. But the thing is, is the math is going to change depending on somebody's monitor size. So, yeah, probably you want to either, when you're doing layout, you're going to stick with either percentages or pixels depending on, you know, if you have a really graphic intensive layout, you're going to want to have you're going to want to have uh, pixels because it's you don't want to mess up your look. Okay, I'm going to put my body tag and I'm going to move that background image actually Let's move the background image. Whoops, no, not inherit.
So I want to take that background image out of here. No, that's not what I want. Now you're not going to ever randomly pick colors. Hopefully you will have a palette picked out. Well, we can talk about Adobe Color here. I want to look at opacity. I'm not sure what it's called. M L M N O opacity opacity. Ah. Let's see if it's opacity. There we go. Opacity. Let's make the background. Let's make it. Mm, 60% so we can see through. <whistles> Semicolon. Oops, I need to get rid of that uh, margin left, right? That's what I wanted to get rid of because that's what's messing me up right now. So that's how you make a prettier web page. Not that I would call that prettier, but you see, you know, you can see the gist. That is how you change basically everything, how stuff looks. Now, though it doesn't look like my opacity is working, does it? Hmm, let's take it down. The other problem is that different commands don't always work on every browser. Like this may not work here, but it may work just fine on Internet Explorer. It's not working in either place. Bummer. Try it on Chrome. Yeah, it could be. And that's the thing. If if you are if you have something that doesn't seem to be working, it's highly possible that it's not working on on that particular browser. Oh, well, the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, uh, pseudo classes because I tell you about pseudo classes in there. And pseudo classes are um, like hover, hit. Um, oh, let me look, look them up real quick what they are. P S E. So let's say I'm going to put in here, I'm going to make this Google link a hit. So I'm going to say a href equals Okay, so now what I can do is I can say, um, if I take a look at this, right now that's blue, right? That's just my typical default. But I can go in actually and make these things all have different colors. For instance, I can go in and say, um, this is called a pseudo class, and I do ask for this. Uh, I want to make the color instead of blue, I want to make it mm, red. And I can say A when I hover over it. So it's A colon hover. Let's have it turn green. I don't know. 
something obnoxious like that. Okay. So let me refresh. So see now it's red. And there it's a lovely shade of obnoxious green. Okay. Kind of, yeah. But those are called pseudo classes. So when you go in there and you look at what is in your um, what is in your uh, on the rubrics, that's going to be there. I need to pull up the rubrics and make sure that I'm looking at everything. Okay, and then the last thing I want to talk about is where else you can put these. Now this is all well and fine. The nice thing is that if I have you know a whole bunch of links here. Every link on the page is going to be the same. I don't have to do that for every link, right? I just put it in the top of the page. But what if I have 12 pages? What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to stick that on every page. So if I want to have consistency, I want to have a site where everything looks the same, right, page to page, I actually want to have it on all of my style on an external sheet so that I can just link my pages to that, right? And then I can just, you know, oh, I don't like that font color, I want to change that, or it's Christmas, I want to make it red and green now. You just change it on the CSS and all of your pages change. So let's talk about how to do that. I, I put it in this page and I kind of like to develop in the page first just because, you know, you kind of get one page the way you want it. Now I'm going to go ahead and I am just going to highlight all of this information now I could actually start on, I'm spitting, I could actually start on a separate page, back up, back up y'all, um, sorry I got that recorded, so she spits at us in class, okay, so I'm going to right click on here, and I'm going to say here where it says CSS styles, move CSS rules to a new sheet. Or if I had an existing style sheet, I could go here and I could browse and find it, but I don't have one, so I'm going to say to a new sheet, and I'm just going to call it whatever main is good. Okay, so that's the same thing. When you're saying sheet, that's the same thing as a page, right? Right. Now look what happened. Over here in my files, now I have main cascading style sheets in here. And over here I have a link. It put that link in there for me. And over here I have this main CSS, and actually you can see, because I have this page open, I have my source code, and it shows here that it's linked to this CSS. So you might have a page linked to three cascading style sheets. It's possible. You may have a templates cascading style sheet, and then, you know, a site cascading style sheet. You could have multiple ones. And by the way, they are from top to bottom order. So let's say you have H1 tags in the one that you have this link right here, and then you have another link right below it to another cascading style sheet. Well, the one below is going to overrule the one above. Just letting you know. Okay. Um, so that's linked, and if I take a look at this, it will show me the code. And Dreamweaver puts in all this handy-dandy stuff. Go ahead and leave that there because different browsers and different servers need sometimes the stuff that it puts in. Go ahead and leave that. But that's all the code that we had. Now what I can do is I can make a brand new page. Call it whatever, just blank HTML. And what I can do over here in the CSS is I can link it. I can find that main CSS, which it's already pointing to. Okay, right now that's a really long thing because this page is not saved, so I'm going to go ahead and save as page two with no spaces or funky characters. So now I have a, just my uh, relational link there. And now all of those styles that I created for the other page, they apply for the second one. So in your assignment, I ask you to look at multiple pages. Here, let me pull up what the rubric is. Okay, remember I said it's both rubric one and two. 
this semester. If I don't change this video, okay. Um, I'll try to combine these into one, but if you look at the assignments for one and two, CSS one, I'm asking for three classes. Not difficult, right? You know how to do a class. Three IDs and three tags that are controlled in your cascading style sheet. So you can have a body tag in the background. You'll have multiple divs where you're doing placement. Okay? Um, pseudo classes, that's the A hover, A link, A uh, hit, or I guess visited is what it is. A colon visited, A colon link, A colon hover are the three biggies. And then I want at least two pages controlled with the same external CSS. Like here. They're linked. Does that make sense? Kind of. What's not making sense? Um, what you're linking to. So here, see, I'm linking. If you look, link. I'm, well, right now it's linking. What I'm saying, I want it linked. I want these linked to the same CSS. And this, in this case, this main.css is what I refer to. It's this other CSS file. And both of these pages. Yes, they will both be styled the same way. Think of how handy that is because if you are in, yeah, different content whatever, you know, my dog, my goldfish, my whatever, different pages. Yes? So the CS1 entry is going to be one whole assignment? Yeah, it's just one whole assignment. I will combine it, actually. Because CSS2 is actually really simple. All I'm asking you to do is use the different places. So I want you to... Um, go in here and do embedded styles which it means that I want it in the head tag within a style tag, right? And then three in line. So one thing I'd like you to do is experiment with like, you know, what happens if you have H1 tags in an embedded and in an external and then in line? Who wins? I want you to tell me who wins. If say I have an H1 tag, I'm not going to tell you. But this is why this is called cascading. Where does cascading come from? Let's say I have in here, in this, I say all of my H1 tags all of my H1 tags should be hot pink. Oops, didn't turn it. Didn't turn it hot pink, did it? Probably said, "God, that's just such bad." Oh, because this is that's a colon. It's such bad taste. Why would you want to do such a thing? We can't turn that hot pink. Okay. Okay. Now, what will happen though, if I say over here, H1 tags should be a different color. Who will win, the external or the? Embedded, do you think? Do you want to figure it out or do we want to? I want you to actually, along with your assignment, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you how it works. I want you to figure it out. See if you can figure out what happens when you have multiple tags going on. That's part of your assignment there, too. So I want you to be able to tell me how that, how that all plays out. Okay. So, that's your assignment. Go ahead and get it started. If you want to, you can use your ugly website as a base. Okay? So, what are the two things you're working on? Peer reviews. Peer reviews, which are due. Yeah. Next to, before next Tuesday. Right. So, do them during the week because your, your fellow students are waiting for their grades. So, if you don't do your wait, work, everybody's going to be saying, hey, buddy, where's my grade? Okay, and then the other thing you are doing is 
the CSS, which is due, assignment one and two, if I don't get around to combining it, CSS one, CSS two, which is due? The 24th. But should you have started it before next week? Yes. Okay, we're good. Get busy.